Oh, hello, you've caught me retweeting one of those posts that's all like, quote, tweet this with your top five movies of all time, because, you know, everyone wants to hear about me. I never look at anyone else's responses, you know, who cares? I just like shouting a little piece of myself into the social media void and then madly refreshing the page in the vain hope my self-esteem will be edified by a raucously positive response from people I'll never meet. Anyway, this got me thinking about why we're so eager to share our liking of things with the world, and I think it's because underneath the sometimes deliberately contrary opinions, we're just trying to share a little bit of ourselves with the world. And... Shrek. And so, for this Friday feature, I thought I'd try something a little different. I'm not ranking stuff, I'm not cooing over water graphics, or arguing with my mum, or forcing Metal Gear references where they don't belong, or seeing how many times I can put in this nice bit of footage I captured from The Witcher 3. There it is again. No, this time, I'm going to share seven games that define me, or certain points in my life, and then invite you to do the same in the comments. Now, I haven't listed these in any particular order, and they're not necessarily my favourite games of all time, although some would definitely make that list too. These are more like games that, for one reason or another, stick in my mind and that resonate with me on a personal level. They define me, if you will, as much as a work of creative fiction can ever define something so complex as a human being. Let me know your own in the comments, but first, watch this video. Okay, number one, Final Fantasy IX. It was a toss-up between this and Final Fantasy VII, and if you asked me what my favourite was out of the two, my answer would change depending on what mood I was in. But right now, medieval fantasy trumps steampunk, so nine it is. Nine came out in the UK in February 2001. I distinctly remember this being the most excited I've ever been for a game. I was three years into my Final Fantasy love affair and had finished seven and eight about four times each. I bought every single magazine that contained even a paragraph on Nine, saving my Dr Pepper pocket money of £2.50 a week to do so. I even struck a deal with my dad, sacrificing my birthday present in December of 2000 in exchange for him buying me Final Fantasy IX on the day it came out, knowing that if I didn't do that I'd have to wait until next Christmas to get it. When the 16th of February finally came round, I was a gibbering mess. Walking with my dad to Electronics Boutique was nerve-wracking, you know, what if they've sold out? What if the Taunton branch just didn't get sent any copies? What if my dad changes his mind? I remember walking in and immediately seeing a wall of white and gold. Or is it black and blue? I can't tell. 50 or so brand new copies of Final Fantasy IX. Their cellophane wrappers glistening like rare crystal in the early morning winter sun. My dad prized one from the highest shelf, held it aloft, a look of mock amazement on his face. He was taking the mick, but I just didn't care. I didn't even really care that we went to visit my uncle for the rest of the day, my PlayStation at home, in my room, waiting with baited disc tray. I just sat in a corner and read the manual all day. Even now, just the memory of the smell of that manual ignites that excitement deep within me. The next week was half term, a week of fantastical escapism and adventure, of unforgettable characters, heartbreaking tragedy and soaring music, of getting up at 6am and not putting down the pad until 10pm. I got lost so fully in that world, my real life and all its teenage stresses, dissolved into blissful nothingness. What a game. Next up, we've got Abzu, the epitome of the move about a pretty world feeling emotions genre. Now, full disclosure, I think I might prefer Journey overall because Journey is just perfect, there's literally not a single thing wrong with that game, but Abzu just has an extra something that resonates with me personally. That extra something is water, obviously. 
and lots of it. Regular viewers will know I'm a sucker for digital water, but Abzu is so much more than just fancy physics and sparkly wave tech. Abzu is about water. It's about the depth and beauty of the world beneath that tantalising surface. A world that is both magical and terrifying, majestic and angry, welcoming and merciless. What I really love about Abzu is how educational it is. You can, if you like, just sit and meditate, the game allowing you to switch between all the different breeds of fish and other sea life in the area and learn their names, observe how they swim and just appreciate their beauty. Interacting with serene manta rays, colossal whales and with the streamlined and beautiful example of evolutionary perfection that is the great white shark are gaming experiences I will remember for a long, long time. Plus, it's refreshing to see a great white depicted responsibly. You know, none of this mindless, man-eating, killing machine nonsense you get in literally every other movie and game about sharks. As well as being joyous to play and look at, Abzu comes with two messages. One is a warning, a warning about ruining the ocean and forever destroying the beauty within. And the other is hope hope that we haven't gone too far, that we can turn things around and that given the chance the ocean will soar back to life as vibrant and diverse as ever. And it's just a brilliant game, play it. The third entry is Kingdom Hearts, easily one of my favourite games of the entire PS2 generation and one that held my hand through a turbulent time in my life when I left home for the first time. Some people fly off to university or college aged 18 with the confidence and grace of a swan. They spread their wings, make new friends and find their true selves. Then there are people like me for whom the whole leaving home and growing up thing is utterly terrifying. People who spend the first few weeks screaming down the phone at their parents that they want to come back because they've made a terrible mistake. I spent the first few weeks of uni hidden away in my dorm room, living off minstrels and coke bought from the student union vending machine, crying into my pillow every night so the other guys in the corridor wouldn't hear me, and, crucially, playing Kingdom Hearts. Thank God. God for Kingdom Hearts, a game about a young boy straddling that awkward divide between childhood and adulthood, who early on is ripped apart from everything he knows and loves, his friends, his family, the warm familiarity of the only home he's ever had. Sora is then thrust into the outside world and it's strange and unwelcoming and full of other people. But Kingdom Hearts is a game about branching out, fighting on, opening yourself up to new people and experiences, and somehow finding that inner strength to unlock the path ahead. What particularly caught me about Kingdom Hearts was how Sora changed and adapted to every world in which he found himself. Sure, these are just aesthetic flourishes, but I chose to see them as Sora changing things up to meet new challenges. For example, he finds himself in Atlantica, a place where by necessity he needs to grow a fishtail to make it through. This versatility was inspiring to me. I thought, you know, if this 14-year-old boy can overcome a massive 50-foot shadow monster destroying his home and then subsequently being stranded in a strange world with no visible means of return, then I can definitely overcome four lectures a week. Sora beats the odds. He finds his light. He saves the world. He reunites with his friends. And I... You scraped a 2-1 in a degree you've never used. And it's all thanks to Kingdom Hearts. Next up is The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, the title I always credit as being the one that marked a huge transition in my gaming life, from child gamer to adult gamer. Before now, I'd exclusively played colourful JRPGs, Crash Team Racing and the odd Metal Gear Solid or 3. 
Oblivion was my first foray into Western RPGs, games less about telling you a story and more about handing you the tools to write one of your own. I'd never known freedom in a game like this before. Yes, I'd experienced open worlds, but not like this, you know. I did the awful pink taxi of death thing and towed police cars off the top of Mount Chiliad in San Andreas. But now I was getting hopelessly, wonderfully lost. Oblivion was exactly the type of game I didn't know I needed. An enormous, deep, detailed, varied, surprising fantasy RPG that rekindled a fire in me I didn't even realise had burned out. The fire of escapism, a fire I used to stoke by scurrying off to a secret corner of my school playing field at lunchtimes to read trashy fantasy novels while everyone else played football. The Wheel of Time, the Belgariad, the Sword of Shannara, the Malazan Book of the Fallen, the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, and now the Elder Scrolls. It was like someone had just scooped up my taste in fantasy fiction and poured it into a PS3 game. It was just perfect and I could not get enough of it. I was in my final year of uni by the time this came out and so was well beyond the Kingdom Hearts settling in stage and it was just everything I ever wanted. Magic and elves and caves and demons and knights and creepy evil things from the past that are best left alone. Perfect. Just perfect. Next up is Dear Esther, which is a game I never played until very recently and just happened to be everything I needed at the time I played it. I've been struggling this year, as I'm sure many of you watching have, with my mental health. I wasn't in a good place when I played Dear Esther. It was a stormy evening in January, my daughter was asleep upstairs, my wife was working a late shift, and I put Dear Esther on. It didn't make me feel any better necessarily, but it did offer something I needed. It was basically a thing into which I could direct myself for two hours, a yawning hole of bleak British melancholy I was able to empty myself into, almost as though, for the brief time I played it, Dear Esther was shouldering my burdens instead of me. It's set on a remote Hebridean island, is eloquently narrated by a man who suffered personal tragedy and impeccably scored by the inimitable Jessica Curry for my money, the single best composer working in video games today. And in a weird way, I enjoyed the greyness, the haunting wails of the music the lonely atmosphere, the bashing wind, and the crisp, precise descriptions of mundane British things like Exeter and empty M5 service stations. The game was like a cold press, you know, not comfortable, not a treatment, but somehow just pleasantly numbing. I only played Dear Esther once, but it's stuck in my brain ever since like a splinter. It was like playing a reflection of my own mental state. It helped me recognise it, forced me to push forward like two negative magnetic fields shoving against one another, the catalyst for slow, reluctant progress. And besides all that, it's just really, really good. The penultimate entry this week is What Remains of Edith Finch, another short game I played at the beginning of the year in a concentrated burst of I'm finishing games now determination. I love this game and will talk your ear off about why if you ever meet me and ask. It's varied and fresh and shocking and funny and haunting all at once and clever. So very clever, and much like Dear Esther, is a game I played at the perfect time. In terms of the story, there's nothing I can identify with really, you know, I haven't inherited a hotchpotch Weasley house and my family isn't cursed, but the game did strike a chord with me in a very particular way. I'm in my 30s now, not really that old I know, but of an age where my earliest memories have started to take on a sort of stretched, translucent quality. You know, they're hard to pin down, like I'm peering at them through an unfocused lens. Nothing's fresh anymore. These memories I have from 20, 25 years ago seem almost otherworldly now, like they happened to someone else. A discomforting sensation, I assume, will only become more pronounced the older I get. 
The only way I can vividly recall these memories now is when I see objects or places. I went to my mum's house recently and she brought out this wooden train my granddad made for me when I was five. I'd completely forgotten it existed until that moment and yet suddenly, looking at it, movie quality images flashed in my mind of times spent happily playing with this train, almost as if the memory was locked inside the toy. It's this sensation that Edith Finch conveys so well. It's a journey through an old house, yes, but more than that, it's a journey through crystallised memory, fragments of time preserved in place and in things. As Edith retraces her family history through the rooms of the house, you can feel that collision of past and present. It's brilliantly done. I honestly think this could be in my top 10 games of all time. It's that good. And if you haven't played What Remains of Edith Finch yet, for whatever reason, then rectify that right now. Okay, final entry, and obviously it's Metal Gear Solid. The game that, as a child, made me realise this thing I liked doing, this playing video games, wasn't just going to be something I'd grow out of, but a passion that would burn right through my life. My mind was blown so many times playing this, it's a wonder I had anything left come the end. And it wasn't just me either, my dad got properly into Metal Gear Solid as well. It used to be I'd go round his house on a Sunday and I'd have to beg for all the PlayStation time he would give me, usually just a couple of hours before lunch. Then when Metal Gear Solid came out, he'd be at the door waiting, pad in hand, menu screen ready, play the game, play the game for however many hours you like, don't even worry about it. This was the one thing I had in common with my dad. He liked triathlons, I liked red wool novels. He liked rugby, I liked football. There was very little we both enjoyed doing until Metal Gear Solid came out. My sister was well into it too, so much so that after we'd finished on the PlayStation, we'd then go outside and play hide and seek in the woods, except it wasn't hide and seek, it was Metal Gear. One of us would be Snake and would have to get from the stump to the stream without the other two seeing. You know, this was Metal Gear Solid 3, an entire six years before it came out. I played that game so much I used to watch it as a movie in my mind before I went to sleep. I knew every line of dialogue, every camera angle, every spike of music. After saving Meryl I remembered my dad's incredulous exclamation of this is better than a movie and knew that games were a thing I'd play forever. So thanks Metal Gear, if it wasn't for you I can safely say I would not be here on this sofa talking about you for the 70 somethingth time for my job. And so there you have it, seven games that define me. Now it's your turn, get in those comments, list seven games that are most important to you and why. They don't necessarily have to be your favourites, just ones that mark important moments of your life or that you look back on with fondness for whatever reason. Then give the video a like if you enjoyed it and hit the notification bell so you stay up to date with all our videos. Thanks for watching and see you next week for another Friday feature. For the players.